Welcome back to another episode of The Road Chose Me. My name's Dan, and on today's episode, let's get right into it. It's time to review the Jeep Gladiator that I designed and built specifically to drive around Australia for 12 months. So Katie and I have been living in this full time. We've covered 50,000 kilometers, about 32,000 miles. How did it perform? What is it like? Let's get into all the details. On today's video, I'll go through the Jeep itself and what it's like as a four wheel drive. Next week, we'll talk about all the living systems that I built into it. And then the week after, I'll talk about things that I learned and things that I'm gonna do differently next time, a couple of mistakes and a couple of areas for improvement. So let's get right into it. Here it is, the one year, 50,000 kilometer review of an Overland Jeep Gladiator. So the first thing I need to talk about is the Jeep Gladiator itself. And this is obviously a huge step up from the older Jeep Wrangler that I drove around Africa. So for me, it felt like really modernizing. The vehicle is much smoother, it's much quieter, it has way more power. And on the whole, when I step back and remember my design goal, what I really wanted was the ability to carry more fuel, more water and more food so that I could get more remote than I ever have in the past. And there's no doubt about it, the vehicle achieved that quite well. Crossing the Simpson Desert was by far and away the furthest I've ever been from civilization. And I have another trip planned very shortly here, even more remote, even further from civilization. So on the whole, the Jeep has done really well. Uh, this is the 3.6 liter petrol engine with the eight speed automatic. That is the only choice in Australia in the Gladiator. So that's the one I went with. Overall, I'm happy enough with it. I've been getting about 13, 14 liters per 100, which is around 18 or 19 miles a gallon, which I'm gonna say is just adequate. In the year 2021, 2022 now, I would have hoped to get better than that, although the vehicle is quite heavy and it's obviously not very aerodynamic. So I'm just gonna have to say that's good enough. But overall, it has achieved its goal and there's a couple of features here on the Gladiator that they don't get talked about very often, but actually I found them really helpful. And the first one is it has inbuilt tire pressure monitoring, but it's not like my old Jeep where it will just warn you when it goes below a certain figure. On the dashboard, it will show me the individual pressure of each tire. So when I'm driving along, if I've aired down, like when I was on the Gibb River Road, notorious road for destroying tires, I could watch at all times the pressure in every tire. And it was really interesting to watch them climb a little bit. I didn't want them to climb more than a PSI or two per tire because that would indicate that they're getting really, really hot, which might lead to a failure. Because I was aired down, you know, you have to be careful about how fast you drive. So it was really interesting to be able to watch the tires so carefully. Another one like that is that on the dash, it will show you the angle you have your steering wheel at. And I found it really helpful a couple of times in deep sand, I would get a bit crossed up and I actually didn't know whether my steering wheel was centered or not. And so I'm plowing through the sand, my steering wheel was actually rotated a full rotation. By being able to see the steering angle on the dash, I could straighten up again without having to stop and get out and have a look. Pretty handy when you're like halfway up a sand dune and you're not quite sure which way you pointed. And then the final thing in that same vein, it will show you on the dash, the pitch and the roll of the Jeep. So fun when you're climbing uphill to see how steep you can go. I think the highest dad and I had in the high country was 25 degrees, nothing too outrageous. But remember in my old Jeep, I added a little spirit bubble so that I could see if I parked level, if I was gonna be sleeping in it. And while I don't sleep in this thing, it is really handy to park at level to make sure that the kitchen winds up level. Otherwise, when you try to cook your eggs in the morning, they all just slide to one side of the fry pan. So oftentimes when I'm parking, I'll bring up the screen that shows me the pitch and the angle of the Jeep, just so I can make sure I've got it within a degree or two of level. And then that's gonna be great for cooking. Also would be really great if you slept on the vehicle. So there are a couple of like electronic gadgetary features. Do you need them? No, definitely not. Are they kind of nice to have? Yeah, I've become really reliant on them as well as the backup camera. When I'm in town, when I'm in parking lots, Australia really isn't designed for a vehicle of this length. This by Australian standards is very big, very long wheelbase. So it's been really handy to have the camera while backing up. Of course, the reverse parking sensors as well. So the Jeep has been really great on and off road, but as well as that, it has some like little electronic features that are nice to have. 
The next thing to talk about on the Gladiator is the tires and the suspension that I ran on this trip. And so to start out with, the suspension is AEV's two and a half inch RT suspension. And it shouldn't be a surprise that this suspension has been absolutely flawless. It's one of the things on the Jeep that I just never even think about. In a sense, it's like it's not even there, which is what you want when you're on a long overlanding trip. You don't wanna to have to be tinkering, adjusting, modifying, repairing, things like that. And so on the nasty corrugations on the Gibb River Road, the suspension was flawless. Obviously off-roading on the old telly track through the sand dunes of the Simpson, it just works day in and day out. And on the road, I would say it drives better than it used to stock. Of course, AEV have ex-Jeep engineers, so it's not surprising that they've engineered a suspension that works so well. And there's no question if I buy another Gladiator or Wrangler, I'm gonna run AEV suspension again. It is that good. Flawless for me in Africa, flawless for me in Australia. I don't think it gets any better than that. On the tires, I know there's quite a bit of controversy that I'm only running 33 inch tires. So these are Yokohama's XAT. These are like their aggressive all-terrain tires. The actual size is 285 70 17, which is kind of the metric version of 33 by 11. And this is a controversial thing because first of all, lots of people say, you know, why didn't you run mud terrains? Most people who are four-wheel driving around Australia will run mud terrains. And then the other one, of course, is, you know, on a Gladiator, everyone in the US is gonna run 35s, probably even 37s is really just considered, you know, normal to be able to go the places that you wanna go and have the capability. And the way I always think about this is, the goal isn't to build the world's most capable vehicle. And I think it's important to keep that in mind because if it was, I would have put 40 inch tires or 42 inch tires and I would have portal axles and I would have six inch suspension lift and all of those kind of like crazy things. And yeah, would it be amazing at Moab or whatever? Definitely. But is that the vehicle that I needed to achieve the trip that I was setting out to achieve? No, I don't think it is. So the goal is to build a vehicle that's capable enough for the trip but it doesn't need to be overly capable because at that point you're spending money, you're compromising the vehicle, you're annihilating your fuel mileage to have capability that you don't even actually need. So now that the trip is mostly done, I think we can look back and say, did I succeed at my mission? And when I think about was the vehicle capable enough, there were two times in Australia where basically I got the Jeep stuck and I wouldn't have been able to move forward without the winch. So one was a mud pit on the Kreb track. And that was kind of optional. We were just testing out our vehicles to see how they performed. Would I have gotten up that with 35s or 37s? I think I probably would have with 37s. 35s is a maybe. I think the long wheelbase you know, comes into play there. And then same story, the other time I winched was exiting one of the creeks on the old telegraph track. And really the same story, the long wheelbase, the breakover angle meant that I bellied out. If I had way more ground clearance, I definitely would have made it without winching. But, you know, is that actually necessary? Because at that point, if I drove everything in all of Australia that I wanted to without ever using the winch, then the vehicle is basically more capable than it needs to be. And then you sort of don't even need a winch. So I think, you know, looking back now and analyzing, this thing is exactly as capable as I needed it to be. I did harder, more technical four-wheel driving than I've ever done in my life. Uh, I certainly drove more sand dunes and more soft sand than I ever have in my life. And in all of that, it performed really, really well. And it only got stopped a couple of times in the entire 50,000 kilometers. So I'm really happy with that decision. And when I look back on it, I mean, it would look way better with 37 inch tires on it, there's no doubt. First problem is the police would put me off the road in a week. But the other problem really does come down to gas mileage. So because of COVID, because of what's happened in the world, fuel price in Australia has gone through the roof. When I first got here, fuel was 25 or 30% less expensive than, I, than it is now. And I already knew it was gonna be expensive. Now it's really expensive. So the bottom line is every single day on this trip, I wished this vehicle got better gas mileage, but there was only a couple of minutes on the entire trip where I wish the vehicle was more capable. So which one actually is more important, more capability or better fuel mileage?
Another addition to the Gladiator that just worked really well is the raised air intake snorkel. And so quite a few people asked, they wanted proof that water actually came over the hood on this trip and that the snorkel was mandatory. And to be honest, water never did come over the hood. Not quite, it got close a couple of times. But the thing is, when I drove the old Telegraph track, the water was just almost at the hood. But a week later, when my friends Lee and Steph drove it, it clearly came over their hood. So if I had just been a week later, it definitely would have come over the hood. So I think for me, a snorkel is just really great insurance of, I wanna go remote, I wanna go places that aren't really maintained roads, that's the insurance that I'm not gonna ingest water and destroy the engine. Same story goes with the pre-filter to keep the dust out of the engine. The dust here in Australia has been pretty bad, although I was surprised it wasn't nearly as bad as it was in Africa. All the same though, I think the dust pre-filter is well worth the addition. So another modification on the Gladiator that has just worked so well, it's easy to forget about it, is the auxiliary fuel tank that I installed. And so this is a 72 litre tank from the Long Ranger, and it's sitting underneath the Jeep opposite the original tank. It's really hard to show you the actual tank, so I'll just show you the filler, which I mean, from the outside looks the same. But this tank has been incredible because not only has it allowed me to get extremely remote in Australia, being able to carry enough fuel for a thousand kilometers or 600 miles without any jerry cans or anything, but it also has allowed me to save quite a bit of money. So the price of fuel varies a lot. When you get really remote, it goes up 50%, sometimes almost double the price. And so I can, when I'm in a bigger town, fill both tanks and then drive a thousand kilometers without filling up again. So it definitely has saved me money. As well as that, I really love how this tank, I have the option to fill either tank, either amount that I want. And so that comes in really handy. Some days I just fill the secondary partially. Sometimes, you know, I fill them both all the way up, but having it all so integrated and all the plumbing is hidden, there's no jerry cans, I never get fuel on my hands, I don't have to wear gloves, all of that kind of thing. This auxiliary fuel tank, to me, has been well worth the money. And do I need one if I'm staying in North America? No, I definitely don't and I wouldn't install one. But on my next massive international overland trip, an auxiliary fuel tank like this is essentially a must. Now that I've had one, it would be very hard to go back. Another modification I made was to mount an ARB air compressor under the hood of the Jeep. And again, it has been absolutely flawless. I've used it a lot on this trip. It doesn't mind the heat under there, it doesn't mind the dust, still performs as well as the day I bought it. So for me, mounting one under there, I think makes so much sense. I'm not using up valuable passenger space where I could have delicate electronics or things like that. It also is smaller than the twin, it's lighter and it costs less money. So for me, although it takes an extra 30 seconds per tire to air up, I think the benefits outweigh that slight waiting game. I will say though, there's one thing about it that really annoys me. This is the standard air hose that it comes with and the standard fitting for the tire. And it comes with this tiny little metal clip that helps it actually stay on the valve. So you can just push it on, it'll clip on, and then you can walk away. For my Africa Jeep, I lost that little clip early on. And so I had to manually hold it on all four tires. And just recently, just this last week, I lost it again off this one. It's this tiny little piece of metal that just kind of rattles and falls out. And so now to air up the tires, I have to physically hold this on all four valves. And again, it's not that big of a deal, but it just means I can't be doing something else at the same time. You know, with that clip, I can plug this in and then go and grab a drink of water or organize my cameras or look at a map and just every minute or two, move it to a new tire until all four of them are done. So I will say ARB, they need to design a better way to have this attached to the tire so that that little clip doesn't fall off. And yeah, I'm probably gonna buy the different attachment that has the built-in gauge or something. I don't love it though, because it's bigger and bulkier and takes up more unnecessary space. So one area for improvement for the air compressor, but definitely for me, having a hard mounted, always ready to go air compressor, it's an absolute must in my overland vehicles. And then the final thing that I'd like to talk about in terms of kind of four wheel drive or core Jeep abilities are the things that I've done here to the front of the Jeep. And so I've added the AEV front bumper. It has the skid plate to protect all the steering. I've got the light force lights. I've got a worn winch and a Factor 55 ultra hook. And this is essentially the same thing that I had on my Africa Jeep. 
And the reason I did it is because it just works. And so I haven't actually hit a kangaroo yet in Australia, fingers crossed. Basically everyone does when they're driving around. It's kind of like hitting a deer. Uh, and I did hit a very big deer with my last Jeep. And so having big radiator protection, I think is just a must. If you're driving around the world, if you're going on a long overland trip, it's pretty common to hit a deer or hit a kangaroo. And if you crack your radiator, that's a really big problem. So a big solid bumper like this, I think is a must. Huge advantage of this too. The approach angle on the Wrangler and the Gladiator is so good. This is really the only vehicle I've ever seen that drove gunshot, the famous obstacle on the telegraph track, and it didn't actually scoop mud at the bottom. Every other vehicle I saw, they came out and all of this was just caked in mud from where that actually hit the bottom as they came up. Versus because the approach angle's so good, this never even touched the bottom. That's pretty impressive. Also, the light force driving lights have just been brilliant. I'm really happy I wired them up so they only come on when the high beams are on. So I think that works really well and I'll do that again in the future. And of course, the worn winch, the usual story with a winch, you carry it around a lot of days and you don't need it. And then when you do need it, you're extremely happy that you have it. Again, I'm certain that I'll do essentially this exact same setup on whatever future vehicle I have. Big solid bumper for radiator protection, good quality driving lights and a really good quality winch. Personally, for me, they're a must have. So I hope that video has been helpful and I hope it gets you thinking about what do you need out of a vehicle to achieve the kind of trip that you have in mind. Because remember, it's really important. There is no such thing as the best or the ultimate overland vehicle. There is just a vehicle that works well to meet your needs. Might not be the same as what meets my needs. So I wanna give you a big broad overview of what has worked well for me and what hasn't worked well for me. Hopefully you can learn from that and design and build your own vehicle. This one was all about the Jeep itself. Next week, we'll go over all the living systems that I designed into this vehicle and how they performed. And then I'll have a whole video of things that I'm gonna do differently next time, some mistakes that I made. So stick around to watch those in the future. But until next time, thanks very much for watching. Have fun out there and maybe I'll bump into you on the road.